which one of us should say it? I'll say it. We'll just wait a minute for people to filter in here. All righty, while the rest of people filter in, we'll get started. Uh, oops. Sorry, I have to pull up the introduction. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, and welcome to the final week of the fall 2020 version of the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. This week, you'll hear from your two hosts, Dr. Liz Lang and me, Matthew Zippel. Uh, Liz is going to kick us off, but first, I'll make a couple of announcements. If you're participating via Zoom, you should see a Q&A tab on either the top or the bottom of your screen. If you open that tab, you'll be able to type any questions that you may have, as well as see and upvote other people's questions. At the end of each talk, we'll go through those questions, starting with the ones with the most votes. However, if you have a clarifying question that you feel like needs to be addressed during one of the talks in order for you to understand something, you can type clarification in capital letters at the start of your question, and Liz and I will do our best to answer those questions in real time. We'll also be posting a recording of these talks on YouTube after it's complete, so if you have to leave early or know others who are unable to attend live, they'll be able to, uh, those talks will be available for viewing and reviewing as many times as you'd like after they're done. And finally, this is the last time you'll have to hear this for a long time, but please, please, please go take three to five minutes to fill out the survey we've been sending around. Your responses uh, will help us know where we're succeeding and where we can do better as we chart our path forward. And it's really important for helping us evaluate our broader impacts. So we'll put a link to that survey in the chat later in case you've missed it. And thanks to those of you who have already filled it out. It's really helpful. Okay, our first speaker today is Dr. Liz Lane. Liz received her PhD from Florida State, where she worked with Joe Travis and Kimberly Hughes, using both theory and empirical work in Mollies to understand the ways in which social environment during development can have important long-term implications for individual life history strategies. She started as a postdoc in Susan Albert's lab here at Duke at the start of 2020, shifting her study system from fish to primates, but maintaining a consistent theoretical thread of seeking to understand the role of the social environment on phenotype and fitness. 2020 might not seem like the best time to move to a new state and join a new lab, uh, but I'm so glad that she did. She's been a terrific lab mate, a wonderfully clear thinker with creative insights that she's always been willing to lend to my own work. So I'm very pleased to welcome Liz today, and I'll turn things over to her now. Thank you, Matthew, for that very nice introduction. Here's the time where I ask if you can see my screen. Great, uh, and thanks all um, for coming to this last iteration of 2020 of the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. As Matthew said, I'm Liz, as you probably know, because you've seen me every week. Um, and today I'm gonna tell you about some of my research on what mediates the relationship between early life adversity and survival in baboons. And before I start, I really would like to thank my co-authors, Xu Xi Zhang, Fernando Campos, Fan Lee, Beth Archu, and Susan Alberts, who have really been a driving force um, in this research. Okay, so understanding the factors importance to differences in fitness is a key question in biology. So we know that developmental processes and environments during early life can affect adult phenotypes. And these adult phenotypes can directly affect fitness, which is often measured by reproductive success or lifespan. And of course, differences in the environment, whether that be abiotic, biotic, or social, can affect both early life and adult phenotypes, which ultimately affect fitness. Often studies focus on one part of this causal chain, for example, determining how early life experiences affect adult traits or how early life affects fitness. But it's unclear how these processes are linked in many systems. For example, for many studies in humans, we know that early life experiences are important. Adverse childhood experiences like abuse, neglect and household dysfunction can negatively affect developmental processes. And ultimately this has been shown to lead to negative behaviors in health and adulthood. However, it's unclear how these experiences during early life and adulthood translate into differences in lifespan. One hypothesis to explain how these early life experiences lead to decreased lifespan is the biological embedding hypothesis. And this hypothesis predicts that adversities during the early life create a pro-inflammatory phenotype in adulthood, which promotes mistrust in others, and it makes it difficult for individuals to form bonds with other individuals. This phenotype also exaggerates the stress response and therefore leads to dysfunction in the HBA axis, which can increase glucocorticoid levels, which I abbreviate as GCs. These adult phenotypes are then hypothesized to lead to negative health effects that decrease lifespan. 
And while we hypothesize that the adult phenotypes drive the relationship between early life adversity and lifespan, this is yet to be explicitly tested. So for example, we don't know if early adversities affect fitness directly as shown by this black arrow, or if there's a mediation effect whereby early adversity affects adult GCs or social bonds, which then affect fitness as predicted by the biological embedding hypothesis. And of course, these effects can all be modulated by the environment and uh, we take those into account with covariates, so I'm not gonna talk too much more about them today. From work on the Ambicelli baboons, we have evidence for part of this causal chain. For example, we know that there's an effect of early life adversity uh, on lifespan. We also have evidence for this orange arrow where we see that early life adversities decrease female-female social bonds, but have no effect on female-male social bonds and also have been shown to increase glucocorticoid levels. In addition, we have evidence for this purple arrow such that decreased social bonds, decreased lifespan, and increased glucocorticoids are also related to decreases in lifespan. So while it's clear that there are links between early life adversity, adult phenotypes, and fitness, it's unclear if the effects of early life adversity on survival are mediated by social bonds and GCs. So in other words, we don't know if early life adversities affect social bonds and glucocorticoids, which in turn affect fitness, or if there's a direct effect of early life adversity on fitness that's not mediated by these adult traits. So today I'm gonna to tell you about a study where we've been able to link real-time data on early life adversities to observations of social relationships, endocrine data, and survival in the same individuals. And in doing so, we provide a test of the biological embedding hypothesis, which predicts that animals who experience early life adversity will have weaker social connections, elevated glucocorticoid levels, and shorter lifespans than those who do not. In addition, this hypothesis predicts that part of the effect of early life adversity on lifespan will be mediated by social connections, and or fecal glucocorticoid levels. To test the hypothesis, we took advantage of a data set from the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project, which is located uh, in Southern Kenya and Northern Tanzania. This project is directed by Susan Alberts, Jenny Tung, Beth Archie, and Jean Altman, and data has been collected on 2,000 individual wild baboons across uh, the almost 50 years of this study. These data are collected by experienced observers um, and everyone involved in the project in Kenya is pictured here. And these have been, uh, these individuals have been with the project for a decade or more. So I'd really like to thank Kinua, Raphael, Langida, and Sarah for their tireless efforts collecting the data. So the Amicelli baboons are a uh, group, of, a population of baboons that we study and they're an admixed population between uh, wild yellow and Anubis baboons, and they live in social groups of 20 to 150 individuals. Males disperse around maturation, uh, where females remain in their maternal social group after maturity. And from the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project, we compiled the data set of 199 females. And from these females, we have almost 12,000 fecal glucocorticoid samples, uh, 1,850 almost years of life that we measure social bond strength and survival on, and 74 deaths. And here I'm only modeling female survival because as I said, males disperse from their natal groups, which makes estimating survival a bit more complicated. Our measurement of early adversity was a cumulative adversity index, which was first uh, written about in this Tung Archie et al paper in 2016. And this is the sum of these six sources of early adversity, which I've written out here. Two sources of early adversity have to do with resources. So whether an individual experiences drought in their first year of life or a high group size when they're born. Two have to do with the maternal social environment, so whether an individual's mom was of low dominance rank or had weak social connections. And two have to do with family structure, so if the individual lost their mom during their juvenile period or had a competing younger sibling that was born close in age to their own birth. One of our adult phenotypes that we're measuring is social bond strength, which I use the dyadic sociality index. And this index measured social bond strength of the top three social partners per year of life. And it's based on grooming relationships. And here negative values mean weaker social bonds on average compared to the population between uh, dyads and higher values indicate stronger social bonds than the population average. Our other phenotype that we're looking at are glucocorticoids. And glucocorticoids are a steroid hormone related to maintaining homeostasis and the stress response. So it's our measure of the uh, hypothalamus pituitary axis, adrenal axis functioning. And we use fecal glucocorticoids, which are integrated over uh, day, hours to days. And as I said, we have almost 12,000 glucocorticoid samples. And for each individual, we have a mean of about 60 samples taken over about six years of their life. So it's a really big data set. And this data set would not be possible with our um, 
out our wonderful uh, lab manager, Laura. So I'd like to thank her here. So to ask and understand uh, the, these questions about how early life adversity, adult phenotypes and fitness are linked, uh, we, and by we, I mean Fan Lee and Xu Zhang, two great statisticians at Duke, have developed uh, a causal mediation framework that allows us to take into account the longitudinal measures of social bond strength and the glucocorticoids and ask how these predict survival over the life course. And so really what we're working to understand is what this black box mechanism that connects early adversity and decreased lifespan is. And we hypothesize that this could be social bonds strength with other females, or it could be social bond strength with other males, or it could be uh, fecal glucocorticoid levels. And this framework allows us to test if these social bonds or fecal glucocorticoids are part of this causal chain that link early adversity and survival. And when I say the fact that they're mediating, I mean that part of the effect that early life adversity affects survival is because it alters these adult traits. And mediation and analysis also allows us to estimate parts of these frameworks. So for example, I can estimate this orange arrow where we determine the effects of cumulative adversity on social bonds or glucocorticoid levels. And we can also determine the effects of social bond strength or glucocorticoid levels on survival. We are also able to estimate the total effect of cumulative adversity on lifespan, which we can break down into two parts that we're really interested in. One, this green arrow, which is the direct effect of early life adversity on survival, independent of changing in the adult phenotype. And two, the indirect effect shown in pink here, which is the mediation effect. And again, tells us how much of the effect of early life adversity on survival is due to early life adversity changing social bonds or changing glucocorticoids, which in turn alter survival. Okay, so first I'm gonna show you the results from where we have female-female social bond strength as the mediator. And for all of these analyses, we see a significant total effect of about 1.5 years, meaning that for every source of early adversity and in individual experiences, their lifespan is decreased by about a year and a half. And we do not see a direct effect whose confidence intervals don't overlap zero, but we do have a significant effect of adversity on the mediator. For each additional source of early adversity a female's experience, her social bonds with other females are decreased by about 0 0.06 DSI units. And for every unit increase in DSI, her lifespan is increased by about 2.2 years. We also have a significant mediating effect of female-female bond strength, which means that for each additional source of early adversity, one month of the difference in lifespan for females that experience early adversity can be explained by the pathway through social bonds. So in other words, early adversity decreases female-female social bonds and decreased survival. And this causal pathway through female DSI explains about 5% of the effect of early adversity on survival. So even though it's there, it's not particularly strong. We see similar magnitudes of effects, but in somewhat different directions for female-male social bonds. So we still have this total effect of early life adversity. However, we see that female-male social bonds are actually increased and stronger in females that experience early adversity compared to those who do not. And again, social bonds with males uh, increase survival by a little over almost two and a half years. We also have a significant mediation effect. However, it's in the opposite direction for female-male social bonds compared to female-female social bonds. And so this means that for uh, each additional source of early adversity, uh, 1.7 months of the difference in lifespan for females that experience early adversity can be explained by the pathway through social bonds with males. And so early adversity increases social bonds with males, which in turn increase survival. And therefore, so female male social bonds could act as a source of resilience to early life adversity. And this causal pathway, again, is there, but it only explains about 9% of the effect of early life adversity on survival. Finally, for glucocorticoids, we find that they do not mediate the effects of early life adversity. So for each additional source of early life adversity a female experiences, her adult glucocorticoids are increased by about 0.1 units and survival is decreased by about 2.3 years. However, there's no significant mediation effect. It's of similar magnitude to the effects of uh, social bonds, but the confidence intervals overlap zero. And this suggests that perhaps early adversity and glucocorticoids have independent effects on lifespan. So if we go back to testing the predictions of the biological embedding hypothesis, I've shown uh, data that support the fact that animals who experience early life adversity have weaker social connections with females, but 
in contrast to the predictions of this hypothesis, they have had they have stronger social connections with males. We also saw elevated glucocorticoid levels in animals who experienced early life adversity and shorter lifespan. And while part of this effect of early life adversity was mediated by social connections, it wasn't mediated by glucocorticoid levels. So in all, I've shown you some mixed support for the biological embedding hypothesis. While social bonds mediate the link between early life adversity and reduced lifespans, glucocorticoids do not. And specifically, social bonds with males uh, are an interesting type of social bond, which act, may act as a source of resilience for individuals who experience early life adversity. And these results suggest that by considering the whole causal pathway, we can gain insights that weren't apparently obvious from focusing on parts of this pathway. So for example, we saw effect, effects of early adversity on GC and of GC on survival, but no mediation effect as I might have expected going into this. <clears throat> And we think that the weak indirect effects, despite strong individual effects, are related to the timing of these effects across the life course, and specifically whether early adversity affects mediators early or later in adulthood, or and or if survival depends more on the current value versus the past or historical value of the mediator. And this might affect the strength of the indirect effect. And while I don't have time to talk about it now, I'm happy to chat more about this later. Um, and so with that, I'll leave you with that tidbit. And I'd just really like to thank the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project uh, and uh, the members of the Alberts Lab who have really helped me through my thinking. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Liz. <clears throat> While questions come in, I'll start with a question, uh, which I'm sure you've thought about quite a lot. Where's the other 90% of the effect? What is happening if it's not these two things? And, and what are the prospects for trying to test that, your ideas about that? Yeah, so I mean, I think part of it has to do with the estimating these indirect effects in the timing, as I said. But I think too, these animals are living in a dynamic environment, right? And so uh, what happens in their first four years of life can affect their lifespan many years later. And so there's lots of things that happen from, you know, four years of life to let's say they live to 15, 15 years of life, right? Um, and that can include, include things such as drought, the, you know, predation, all sorts of things could have this, these effects. So yeah, good question. Uh, well, I have one more. Um, so the, I'm sorry if I missed this, but the, the, the mediators are all uh, discrete time units, right? So like it's, it's does, does social connectedness at age five predict survival at age five, is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> in this version, yes. And, and so my question, I guess, is do you think that there might be some kind of integrative effect where uh, those those mediators from you know age five might be affecting survival at age eight or nine or whatever? So we have also looked at uh, the mediator model in several different ways. Uh, one is like a cumulative effect over the lifespan from like age five to age however old you uh, you die at or your survival at each time point. Um, and also we've looked at this lagged effect where your survival at age six is determined by your current value of the mediator, but also by the mediator for the past year or three years. And we see pretty similar results in terms of the, the magnitude and direction of the effects. But yeah, I think thinking about the timing in that way is really important. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk more about that later too. Uh, we have a couple more questions now. Uh, Mark Halber asks, he says, Liz, I hate to ask, but can you get causal statistical explanations from observational data? That is a great question. Um, and so there's this whole uh, statistical framework called, called causal mediation analysis, which is what we are using. And it aims to get these causal explanations from observational data. However, the caveat is, is there's a lot of assumptions that need to be met and so thinking about these assumptions really carefully is something that we spend a lot of time on and also doing sensitivity analyses to ensure that we're not seeing these relationships because of a confounding their variable or something like that. Um, so I think it's possible, but it is difficult. Um, so I had try to hedge my bets a little bit as to how causal these things are. Great, and we've got one more question on, on YouTube. Uh, David Fisher asked, uh, thanks for the interesting talk, Liz. Do individuals that face early adversity die in different ways uh, from ones that don't? For example, illness versus predation or something. I think that's a fascinating question and one that I'm not sure of. It is hard to track exactly how individuals die. For some individuals, we do know that they had wound pathologies, for example, and then they tend they disappear or we find a body. But for a lot of individuals, we don't know their cause of death. Um, 
but fascinating to follow up on. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks very much, Liz. Uh, it's really cool to see all that coming together. So thanks for giving that talk. Great. Of course. And now I'll give uh, my introduction for you. So I'm really thrilled now to introduce my co-host, Matthew Zippel, as our final speaker of 2020 for the LTAR. Uh, Matthew is a PhD candidate in the Department of Biology at Duke University. Uh, and before that, starting at Duke, Matthew completed his undergraduate at UNC, where he double majored in biology and political science. Matthew's research uses theory, long-term data, and experiments to learn about the ways in which animals interact with each other and their environment. And his dissertation work focuses on how baboons influence the fitness of juveniles in their social groups um, across a variety of different levels. So he's addressed this question by examining fetoside and infanticide, male-mediated pregnancy termination, and the effects of maternal early life on offspring fitness. In addition to his work on ambacillae baboons, Matthew has studied these questions in a number of different primates, and he's completed work focused on categorical perceptions and behavioral senescence of songs, birds. Uh, despite or maybe because of his productive research, Matthew is really a highly collaborative and collegial lab member who's also who's always happy to help with my thinking and other members thinking and research questions. So I have really enjoyed getting to know him um, for my year in the Alberts lab. So with that, I'm really excited to turn it over to Matthew to hear more about um, his primate research. Great. Thank you, Liz. That was very kind of you. Can you see my screen OK? Great. OK, so hi, everyone. When I started this series uh, back in May, I hoped to host a series that showed how long-term studies reveal otherwise hidden phenomena in animal behavior, life history, population dynamics, and evolution. And 41 speakers later, uh, I think we've made a lot of progress towards that goal. Uh, I know that I've learned a lot and thought about existing and new questions in my mind in exciting new ways. So I just want to start off by thanking all of our speakers over the last seven months, and I'll hope to continue moving us towards that goal with my talk today by describing some ways in which demographic data can reveal otherwise hidden social phenomena in primates, how those insights uh, can advance theory, and how they can inspire shorter term targeted data collection or analysis. Um, before I, oops. Before I get into any specifics, I'll start just by briefly reintroduction, reintroducing the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project, uh, though Liz told us really everything I need to mention. Uh, as Liz mentioned, the project started in 1971, so we have nearly 50 years of demographic, environmental, and behavioral data at this point from nearly 2,000 individuals. And uh, I include this picture here of Jean Altman from her 1980 book, Baboon Mothers and Infants, uh, to highlight both the long period of observation and to show you just how close observers can be to these baboon groups without uh, disturbing their behavior. These are very well habituated uh, animals. Here's a lovely picture that captures the Ambicelli study system quite nicely. You can see it's a pretty sparse savanna environment with infrequent patches of trees. And I really like this image because it shows you a lot about baboon natural history. You can see here that there, these are multi-male, multi-female groups of terrestrial monkeys. And if you look around this image, you can see immature and adult individuals engaged in a range of social behaviors from feeding or drinking to walking to sitting alone or sitting together and grooming. And looking at this group, you can perhaps imagine the complex social relationships that might exist and how those might impact the survival of individuals in the group. Um, I'll reference papers involving a lot of co-authors today, but I want to especially acknowledge the directors of the project who Liz introduced earlier. And I will also echo Liz's comments that all of the work that I'll talk about today is only possible because of the data collected by the extraordinary team of observers and support staff that carry out the day-to-day -day monitoring of the population. So thanks to them. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about work that I've led uh, during my dissertation that's focused on understanding the social determinants of immature survival in wild primates and especially in the baboons of Ambicelli. In other words, I want to understand the relationship between the survival of fetal, infant, and juvenile baboons and social behaviors involving either related or unrelated individuals in their social group. And this is an effort that's benefited greatly from the nearly 50 years of infrastructure created and data gathered in this population, but it also comes with four perhaps obvious and, and major challenges. First, although observers visit social groups six days a week, 52 weeks a year, they study multiple social groups at any given time. And each social group that they do study has many individuals within it, and those individuals are engaged in many social relationships. So the resulting observations are inevitably going to be incomplete for that reason. And second, these observations occur exclusively during the day. And some events that might be especially important for immature survival, such as predation, occur almost exclusively at night. 
And so as a result, we know when an immature baboon dies because it disappears, but direct observation of death is quite rare. And finally, if you think about yourself as, as, as an observer with the baboon group, it isn't necessarily obvious from a 30,000 foot perspective what kinds of social behaviors are most important for immature survival. And it could very well be the case that the most important behaviors are uncommon or otherwise hard to see. Uh, so you can see there's then a range of challenges that could make it rather difficult to study this question. Um, and today I'll talk about how these challenges can be overcome by relying on long-term demographic data. And by that, I mean births, so the creation of these two tiny little cartoons, deaths, and, and, and immigrations. And I'm going to argue that long-term demographic data can provide at least three benefits beyond analyses that are looking at questions that we might expect to fall under the traditional heading of demography. Uh, first, demographic data allow us to infer social behaviors and social determinants of survival. Second, they can lead to advances in evolutionary theory. And third, they can inform or inspire short-term or highly targeted behavioral observations or analyses. I'll show the power of demographic data to achieve these three ends through two separate vignettes from my dissertation work. Uh, the first vignette has to do with feticide and infanticide by recently immigrated male baboons. Uh, first, to make sure we're all on the same page, let me provide a bit of background about infanticide by males. Uh, infanticide by males was first observed in Langers in the 1950s, and at first researchers came up with a range of non-adaptive explanations for, for this behavior that was quite troubling at the time. Uh, for example, perhaps this behavior was simply pathological, uh, or alternatively, the result of unnatural stress imposed on males as a result of recent human incursion into the area. Or alternatively, perhaps killing infants was an accidental and unavoidable byproduct of the aggression that males need in order to uh, successfully immigrate into a new group. It wasn't until the 1970s that Sarah Hurdy provided a hypothesis for why this behavior may be adaptive for males. Her hypothesis, now called the sexual selection hypothesis of infanticide, keyed in on an important facet of primate reproduction, which is that after pr female primates give birth, they're infertile for a period of time while they're lactating. Then after weaning their infants, they again become reproductively available. So if a male immigrates into a group and finds a female with an infant who's lactating, right, then he can't mate with her because she's not reproductively available. But importantly, if females lose their infant, then they tend to go back into estrus quite quickly and so become reproductively available again. So Hurdy's hypothesis explaining the adaptive benefits of infanticide to males rests upon three predictions. First, males will be unrelated to the infants that they kill. Second, females who lose their infants to infanticide will return to sexual cycling sooner than they would if they had raised their infants to the age of weaning. And finally, females will ultimately mate with and reproduce with the killers of their infants. Uh, and if these three predictions hold, then infanticide by males should be selected for. Now, more than four decades later, data supporting the sexual selection hypothesis have been reported in dozens of species of mammals and it's well accepted theory. Um, but there was a component of this hypothesis that has been largely neglected, however, which is that the same logic should apply to selection on males to kill fetuses living inside pregnant females. If you think about it, the, the same constraints that males face when they find a lactating female are even stronger when they encounter a pregnant female because pregnant females certainly are not reproductively available. They can't become pregnant again. And the period of time between when a male encounters a pregnant female and when she will be returning to estrus is quite a bit longer than when he encounters a lactating female because she needs to uh, carry her pregnancy to term, have the infant, and then nurse the infant for the whole period of, of dependence. So the timeline from finding the female to being able to mate with her if he does nothing is longer than when he finds a, a lactating female. Um, and and uh, so since 1984, <laughs> there have been a few case studies of apparent feticide, or I guess right around that, starting right around that time. Uh, and those case studies have been published in, in, in Langer's and in the Ambicelli baboons, but there's been, previously there'd been no population-wide analyses of it prevalence in a population. And that conspicuous absence makes a lot of sense. Infanticide is notoriously difficult to observe directly because it can occur quite quickly and out of sight of an observer. Um, and feticide is that much harder to see directly because in order to confirm that feticide has occurred, an observer first needs to document that a female is pregnant. He, uh, she needs to identify a dangerous male immigration and then show that the female terminated her pregnancy in response to that male's aggression, which is really quite a tall order. 
So rather than relying on seeing infanticide or feticide occur directly, uh, I relied instead on demographic data to infer when infanticide and feticide occurred. Fortunately for me, female baboons show clear indications of the onset of pregnancy, and the Ambicelli project has developed a protocol that allows us to identify both conception and termination dates with a high level of precision. Um, so specifically what we did is we identified 75 immigrations of especially aggressive adult males into new social groups. So these are males that ascended to a high rank quite quickly and then stayed in their new social group for a long time. And we compared the rates of fetal and infant death in those specific social groups during the two weeks immediately before and immediately after those male immigrations. If aggressive males are coming into new social groups and killing infants and fetuses without us directly observing that behavior, then we'd expect those death rates to increase in the weeks immediately after their immigration. Um, so prior to male immigration, rates of death were pretty low, less than one per hundred individuals during that two week period uh, right before male immigration. But after male immigration, we saw a nearly 300% increase in both infant and fetal death rates, providing really quite strong demographic evidence that males were coming into social groups and killing fetuses and infants without us directly observing that behavior. These extra deaths account for about 2% of all infant mortality in the population and about 6% of all fetal mortality. So we're able to use demographic data to infer this important social determinant of immature survival in the population. All right. Well, how can these results lead to advances in evolutionary theory? Well, we can use computer simulations to compare the adaptive value of feticide to infanticide. In this simulation, a male of a given tenure length immigrates into a social group and kills either fetuses or infants, and we compare the reproductive opportunities that he gains as compared to a strategy of inaction where he does nothing. So the y-axis here are total mating opportunities relative to a male doing nothing. Um, so first on the left, we look at a species based on a baboon's reproductive schedule where females do not display estrus after giving birth until they've weaned their offspring. And here we see that infanticide, that's the square point, uh, provides greater reproductive opportunities than does inaction, which is what we would expect. Um, but also nearly, for nearly all potential tenure lengths, the feticide strategy provides even greater reproductive benefits to males. And on the right, we model a species in which females return to cycling immediately after giving birth, which is actually the more common outcome in mammals. And here, infanticide is no longer beneficial to males, but feticide still is. And the reason for that is because generally, if a male can come into a group and the female has is lactating, she has an infant, uh, she's already reproductively available again, and killing the infant isn't going to hasten her return to, to cycling. She's already cycling. But in these situations, feticide is still beneficial because if he comes in and finds a pregnant female, he can't mate with her regardless, right? There's no, there are, well, there may be one species, but in general, pregnant females are not going to be pregnant again. They are, they are uh, unable to be, to reproduce with these immigrant males. And so we argue then based on the simulation that feticide by males should be under stronger selection than is infanticide by males in nearly all mammalian species meaning that we expect feticide and counter strategies to feticide to be more widespread across mammals than is infanticide. And since the selective pressure of infanticide has been invoked to explain a wide range of mammalian social and reproductive behaviors, including monogamy, the development of pair bonds, male-female associations, female-female associations, grouping and ranging behavior, promiscuity, and has been the subject of at least two books, we feel that the importance of feticide in the evolution of mammalian social behavior is quite understudied by comparison. Finally, I'll just briefly describe a highly targeted analysis of behavior that was inspired by these previous demographic results. Uh, if males are coming into groups and pursuing a strategy of specifically attacking pregnant females so as to cause them to terminate their pregnancies, we would predict that aggressive males specifically target pregnant females for aggression. So we sought to determine whether that was the case. To do this, we looked at those same two week periods following male immigrations that we had identified as periods of feticidal activity and compared the proportion of female directed aggression that's directed at pregnant females by resident males as compared to recently immigrated males. We predict that if immigrant males are targeting pregnant females for aggression, then they should be directing a greater proportion of their aggression towards pregnant females specifically as compared to resident males. So before I show you those results, I'm gonna explain the y-axis on this figure. In this example, imagine that a particular immigrant male directed 40% of his female-directed aggression to pregnant females. 
And over the same two week period, resident males in the same group directed only 20% of their aggression to pregnant females. Well, that immigration would end up with a value of 0.2 on the y-axis here, 0.4 minus 0.2. So here, positive values mean that immigrant males are directing a greater proportion of their aggression towards pregnant females as compared to resident males, and negative values mean the opposite. So now I'll show you these data, and I'll note that the size of each point reflects the immigrant male's weight in the model based on the total number of aggressive interactions that he had with females following his immigration. And so what you can see is that on average, that's the dashed line is the average, immigrant males are directing a disproportionate amount of their female directed aggression towards pregnant females as compared to resident males, which is providing strong support then for the idea that males are specifically targeting pregnant females for aggression. All right, so to return to this framework, I've shown you that in the case of feticide and infanticide by male baboons, long-term demographic data do allow us to infer social behavior and social determinants of survival. They lead to advances in theory and they can inspire highly targeted behavioral analyses. The second vignette that I'll tell you about is about the novel effects of maternal death on offspring fitness. And I'll set up the context for the second example with a cartoon. Imagine that a mother baboon who I'll call M and her immature daughter, who I'll call F1, uh, is, exists in this world. And let's imagine that F1 is either near the age of weaning or is already past weaning. Well, what happens if M dies? The hypothesis that I'll explore is that experiencing maternal death in early life leads to both acute and chronic reductions in offspring condition. And I'm going to assume that individuals that are in worse condition are more likely to die and less able to provide maternal care because they're in poor condition. This hypothesis and assumption then lead to four predictions about the way in which M's death, which occurs during F1's early life, leads to reductions in F1's fitness. First, the death of M is likely to affect immature survival of F1 after the death of M occurs. This is perhaps quite intuitive. If an immature primate loses her mother, she's more likely to die thereafter as a result of no longer having a mother. Second, the death of M is predicted to be associated with reduced immature survival of F1 even before the death of M occurs. This prediction is based on the idea that if M is going to die in the near future, then M is likely to be in poor condition for a period of time before her death. And so as a result, she's less able to provide maternal care and F1 should be less likely to survive during that period before M's death when M is still alive. Now let's imagine that F1 survives both those blue and purple arrows, grows up into an adult baboon and has her own offspring, who I'll refer to as F2. There are then two additional ways in which M's death, which occurred in F1's early life, is predicted to affect F1's fitness. Specifically, we expect the death of M to affect adult survival of F1. The idea here is that M's death in F1's early life leads to this chronic reduction in F1's condition, and so then we expect her to face increased mortality in adulthood, leading to a shorter lifespan. And finally, we expect there to be an intergenerational effect such that M's death in F1's early life affects the immature survival of F2. The reasoning here is that if M's death in F1's early life is leading to this chronic reduction in physical condition, then we expect her to be less able to provide the necessary maternal care to keep her own offspring alive. Now, in the interest of time, I won't show you evidence from Ambicelli that either the blue or the red arrows exist, but they do, and they're quite strong. Um, instead, I'll focus on the purple and gold arrows, which have not been previously explored in a wild animal. And I'll emphasize that the prediction in both cases for the purple and gold arrows is that uh, females, either M towards the end of her life or F1 throughout adulthood, are less able to care for their offspring and keep them alive. So these are fundamentally uh, hypothesized to do, uh, social processes. And I'm gonna test for them again using demographic data. So let's start with this purple arrow where we predict that offspring should be less likely to survive in the period immediately before their mother's death. What we really wanna do here is to measure the effect of an unmeasured variable, which is maternal condition on both offspring survival now, as well as maternal survival in the future. So again, the assumption here that we're making is that mothers who are in worse physical condition are both more likely to die in the near future and they're less able to keep their offspring alive before they die. So the association that we're actually going to test for is whether offspring are more likely to die in the years immediately prior to their mother's death. And we can do that because we know the ages at which offspring and mothers die. The data set that we'll use uh, 
to ask this question contains 1,123 offspring for whom two pieces of information are known. And that's all we need to know really, which is whether the mother of the offspring died in year zero through four after the offspring was born and whether the offspring itself died in year zero through two of life. And the statistical approach that we'll take is to build a mixed effects Cox proportional hazards model where the response variable is offspring survival during year zero through two and the predictor variable is a binary indicator of whether the mother died during year zero through four after offspring birth, which is what we're taking as our measure of impending maternal death. And I'll note here that we use censoring of offspring lives such that the model is only concerned with the period of an offspring's life when its mother is still alive. If the mother dies and the offspring's still alive, the model isn't concerned with that, that period of its life going forward. So now I'll show you those results. Here you'll see the proportion of offspring surviving to a given age on the y-axis, and I'll show you two curves. The black curve indicates the baseline survival scenario for offspring whose mothers are going to survive the entire four-year period after the offspring is born. Their mothers are not going to die in the near future. Whereas the red line indicates offspring whose mothers will die in the near future, within four years after the offspring's birth. So what we see is that offspring are 30% more likely to die during the first two years of life if their mothers are going to die in the near future. Again, if an offspring's mother is going to die soon, that offspring is less able to survive even before that death occurs while its mother is still alive. So if we return to this framework, we can now conclude that this purple arrow does exist in baboons as offspring are more likely to die as immatures even before early maternal death occurs. Okay, so how about this gold predicted arrow? Is there an intergenerational effect of early maternal loss on offspring survival? To answer this question, we looked at the survival of 742 offspring and determined whether the mother of those offspring had experienced early maternal loss when she was immature. So again, we use a Cox proportional hazards model with a response variable of offspring survival now to age four, this time with a binary predictor variable of whether the mother experienced early maternal loss when she was young. And we control for whether or not the offspring experiences early maternal loss directly. So now I'll show you those results. Again, you'll see two different offspring survival curves. The black line now indicates survival of offspring whose mothers did not experience early maternal loss when they were young. And the red line indicates survival of offspring whose mothers did experience early maternal loss. Again, we're looking at that intergenerational effect here. So what we see is that there is an intergenerational effect of early maternal loss such that offspring are about 40% more likely to die as immatures if their mothers experienced early maternal loss when they were young. So we're talking you know, anywhere between six and 15, 20 years previously, the mother experienced early maternal loss in this case, and that's having an effect on offspring survival. All right, so if we return to this overview, we can now say that we have strong demographic evidence for the existence of an intergenerational effect and indeed, uh, all, all four of these predictive relationships between maternal survival and offspring fitness. Okay, so we now know that each of these associations exists in baboons. What, what about in other primates? Um, and as in baboons, my focus here will be on those gold and purple arrows that are relatively unexplored. So to answer this question, I worked in collaboration with the Primate Life Histories Working Group, whose database contains just the kind of demographic data that we need to ask these questions in eight populations of seven species of primates, including in two species of great apes, two species of old world monkeys, a lemur, and two new world monkeys. And I'll gratefully acknowledge my co-authors on this part of the talk, the PIs whose data are contained in the database, and I'll also thank the demographers who worked to develop this incredible tool. So let's turn to the first question at hand here. If a mother's going to die in the near future, are her offspring at an increased risk of death while she's still alive? And I won't go into the methods except to say that I took the same approach that I took in baboons in terms of asking whether maternal death in the first four years of life after offspring birth was predictive of offspring survival during years zero through two of life. And before I show you the results of this comparative analysis, let me orient you to this figure that x-axis here are the mortality coefficients from the mixed effects survival models for each species. So in this case, a positive coefficient estimate means that offspring are more likely to die in years zero through two if their mothers are going to die in the near future. So positive values essentially means like baboons. And so for reference here, uh, I'll show you that result here that it's the same result I showed you earlier in baboons. And if I show you the results for each species, 
Uh, what you see is that in five species, murikis, chimpanzees, capuchins, baboons, and shafakas, offspring are at an increased risk of death in years zero through two if their mothers are going to die in the near future. And if we combine all the data into a single model along with a random effect of species ID, we see a strong and significant effect across species. And there's certainly quite a lot of variation here, right? We don't see a significant effect in gorillas or blue monkeys, but still I'm really quite struck by the overall consistency of this effect ac across these primate species that have really quite different natural histories, body sizes, and life history schedules. All right, how about this second question? Is there an intergenerational effect of early maternal loss on offspring survival? As in baboons, I'm asking here, uh, whether there's an intergenerational intergener effect of a mother experiencing early maternal loss before she reached a species specific age of maturity um, on offspring survival in the next generation to that same age. So because we're using a species specific age of maturity here uh, and unlike in the previous analysis, we can't build a combined species model here. Uh, but the x-axis is interpreted in the same way as in the previous slide. So again, I'll show you the baboons uh, first for context and then looking across the rest of the species, we see strong and significant intergenerational effects of early maternal loss on offspring survival in murikis and blue monkeys, as well as a strong but not statistically significant effect in chimpanzees. So it seems that the intergenerational effect of early maternal loss on offspring survival is not as universal as is the effect of impending maternal death, but it is certainly not restricted to any peculiarities of the Ambicelli system. All right, so to sum up, we see an association between impending maternal death and offspring survival in baboons, murikis, chimpanzees, shafakas, and all seven species when we take them together. And we see evidence of an intergenerational effect of early maternal loss in baboons, murikis, blue monkeys, and perhaps in chimpanzees. And all of this evidence is consistent with this overall framework I've laid out of mother offspring social processes. And all of that comes entirely from demographic data, just dates of births and deaths. All right, so how do these insights affect our understanding of evolutionary theory? Specifically, how do these connections between maternal survival and offspring and grand offspring survival influence the evolution of primate life histories? First, I'm going to describe a verbal model, and then I'll describe the general shape of some qu uh, quantitative life history modeling that I've been doing with another graduate student. So first, here's the verbal model. What we're really describing here is a classic maternal effect where the phenotype of a mother in the form of her longevity affects the phenotype of her offspring in the form of survival and their offspring survival. So by surviving, mothers are increasing their inclusive fitness, not only by extending their reproductive lifespan, but also by assisting their existing offspring in surviving and successfully re reproducing. Under this scenario, females should be under stronger selection to live longer lives as compared to a scenario where those same links between maternal longevity and offspring fitness don't exist. Now, that's not exactly a new idea. It's completely in line with existing maternal effects in indirect genetic effects literature. But what is new is that we can see now in baboons and other primates that the connections between maternal survival and offspring fitness are stronger and greater in number than previously realized. So now let's put some numbers on here, try to get a better handle on things. What I'm going to show you here is what I'm calling for now, the grand reproductive value of a female baboon using previously calculated life table data from the Ambicelli population. This is the same concept as reproductive value, which is that you know, relative to a female at birth, how much reproductive success do we expect a female of a given age to have remaining in her lifespan? But in this case, instead of counting the number of daughters that we expect her to have, we're counting the number of surviving granddaughters that we expect to ultimately descend from her lineage. By counting surviving granddaughters, we're able to account for all four of these links between maternal survival and downstream fitness outcomes, some of which, which would not be realized until we consider the survival of granddaughters. So using the life table data from the population, along with these four connections that were measured in the population, we can estimate the grand reproductive value for females of a given age under two different scenarios. In black, I'll show you the grand reproductive value if we assume that none of these links exist. This ends up being the exact same shape, uh, exactly equivalent to a traditional reproductive value estimate. And in gold, I'll show you the grand reproductive value if we assume that all four of these links between maternal survival and offspring fitness exist using measured parameters from Ambicelli. So looking at these two curves, you can see that the estimated grand reproductive value reaches a peak at a later age when we assume that these links exist, 
and grand reproductive value doesn't fall to zero until several years after, uh, several years later, that is, as compared to the scenario when we assume that none of these links exist. In other words, there should be stronger selection for female survival, all else being equal, when we assume that these links exist, which is the exact same conclusion that we reach in our verbal model. So now let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that a mutation arises that simultaneously generates an increase in birth rate, but also an increase in adult mortality, a classic trade-off between maintenance and reproduction. For a given increase in birth rate, there's then some increase in adult mortality that will result in equivalent reproductive success, by which I mean surviving granddaughters, as compared to the baseline scenario when mortality and birth rate are unchanged. Given these grand reproductive value estimates, we would then we, can, we would predict that for a given increase in birth rate, the maximum increase in mortality that still yields net benefits as compared to the baseline should be lower when mother offspring fitness links exist as compared to when they are absent. So in other words, it should be harder to shorten a lifespan in exchange for increased birth rate when these links exist. Let me show you some modeling results here. What I've done here is to identify the value of that trade-off threshold for a range of changes to baseline birth rate in our population. So here on the x-axis, you'll see the change in birth rate. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the threshold for the change in adult mortality that still yields net benefits as compared to the baseline scenario. So let's focus on the right-hand side of this figure first, where we're increasing the baseline birth rate from, zero, from between 0 and 10%. What we're asking here is how much of an increase in mortality can be sustained by a given increase in birth rate. And what we see is that for all increases in birth rate, the maximum increase in mortality that can be sustained while still delivering net benefits is higher when those connections are absent as compared to a scenario where all the connections are present. So for example, if a mutation confers a, a consistent 5% increase in birth rate across the lifespan, that same mutation can confer up to a 10.9% increase in, in mortality and still deliver net benefits when no mother infant fitness links are present. But that maximum increase is only 7.5% when all four connections are assumed to be present. We can now turn our attention to the left side of this figure and decrease birth rate from the baseline. So we're now asking how much of a decrease in mortality is necessary for a given decrease in birth rate to yield net benefits. And here we see that the pattern is flipped such that for all decreases in birth rate, the minimum decrease in mortality that's necessary to sustain a decline in birth rate is higher when those mother infant fitness connections are present as compared to the scenario where they're absent. So we can distill this result into a single takeaway, which is that it's easier to evolve longer lifespans and slower reproduction when links exist between maternal survival and offspring or grand offspring survival, or said more simply, it's easier to evolve slow life histories, long life, slow reproduction, when links between maternal survival and grand offspring, offspring and grand offspring survival exist. Um, so this is the deterministic model. To validate my evolutionary argument and add in ecological relevance, I've co been collaborating with, with Jimmy Penniston, a graduate student at the University of Florida, who's built an individual-based evolutionary model that asks the same in question, oh, there's Jimmy, <laughs> that asks the same question and assesses the deterministic predictions. Um, the, the predictions of the deterministic model are here on the left, and now I'll show you the results of the individual-based model. Uh, you'll see they're almost exactly the same, which gives us confidence that these results are broadly correct, although there's still some fine-tuning to do uh, on this project. All right, I'm going to close out briefly here by touching on one final project that's still in progress, which involves targeted behavioral sampling inspired by the results from the long term demographic data. If we return to the result that there's an intergenerational effect of early maternal loss on offspring survival, that's part of a broader pattern that we've identified that there's an intergenerational effect of maternal early life adversity on offspring survival. And you'll recall from Liz's talk that there are those six sources of early adversity that collectively predict female adult survival. And simply put, those same sources of adversity have adverse intergenerational effects uh, for those females' offspring. So we sought to identify the proximate behavioral mechanisms by which that intergenerational transmission from mother to offspring occurs. And what we're doing, uh, we're, we're asking this by, by asking whether mother-infant pairs where the mother experienced early life adversity look different from pairs where the mother did not in terms of the maternal care provided or the trajectory of infant social development. So in 2018 and 2019, I went to the field along with a couple of terrific field assistants, Stephanie Clinton and Chelsea Southworth, 
And we performed these detailed mother-infant focal follows where we followed mother-infant pairs for 45 minutes at a time and recorded pretty much every bit of data that we could manage. And I won't get into too many details about that protocol, but we've collected over 600 hours of data from 48 mother-infant pairs where the infant was between zero and eight months of age. In this figure, each row is a different pair, mother-infant pair, and each point is a 45-minute follow. Uh, so you can see they're well distributed across that zero to eight month range. And I'll just tell you briefly about a preliminary result that's come out of this data, which is that uh, first of all, individual infants vary consistently in terms of the number of adult males that they spend time around. So on the y-axis here is the average number of adult males that an infant is within five meters of. And on the x-axis is infant age. Um, and I've highlighted here on the left for infants who are consistently above the population average, which is that line across samples. And on the right, for other infants that were consistently below that population average. So in these figures, each point is a sample color coded by infant and that line is the population average. So some infants consistently spend more time around males and others consistently less. And part of that individual repeatability is explained by the early adversity experienced by the mother. So here the axes are the same, but I'll show you the average number of adult males uh, with which infants are in close proximity, depending on the early adversity that the mother experienced when she was young. And you can see that offspring whose mothers experienced higher levels of early adversity, that's the red and the orange lines, were on average in close proximity to more adult males as compared to infants of mothers that had experienced less early adversity. And that effect is strongest in the, in the youngest infants and declines as they age. So there's still a long way to go on this front, um, but this result is consistent with the idea that Liz presented earlier that adult males might be able to mitigate the negative effects of early adversity for females and their offspring. So I'll return to this framework one last time and just conclude by saying that I hope I've convinced you that long-term demographic data have a lot to offer. My experience has been that thinking creatively about how to use demographic data can open the door to a wide range of analyses and future research directions that I would have never previously considered. So if you're out there and you've got long-term demographic data, I would encourage you and your students to spend time poking at it and thinking about how you might be able to use it to ask questions that don't fall under the traditional umbrella of demographics. Um, with that, I'll close by acknowledging the project directors, the field team, the members of the Alberts Lab, all of my co-authors on these projects, and, and my funding sources. And I would be happy to take any questions that folks might have. That was really great, Matthew. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we have some questions already and more will be coming in, I'm sure. Uh, so anonymous attendee asks, uh, any thoughts on the mechanism on how males know females are pregnant? Uh, is it that they're not receptive to sex? And then how do female counter strategies fit into this, such as confusing paternity and mating as soon as possible with immigrant males if she's already pregnant? Yeah, so in baboons, the answer is really easy. And in other species, it's less easy. In baboons, when females become pregnant, there's uh, this, this part of their body called the paracolossal skin, which is the skin immediately surrounding their callosities um, that turns from black to pink. And so that, that really makes it quite clear. And then when they're no longer pregnant, that gradually changes back from, from pink to black. Um, and so that's kind of a puzzle, right? Why in the world would females who are potentially the, gonna be the victims of male aggression advertise the fact that they're pregnant? Um, and that's kind of a really interesting question. There's uh, some evidence from, um, from all of baboons and work done by Andrea Bailey that uh, that pregnancy sign might signal to relatives that, that females may be in need of assistance, right? And so by signaling to allies that uh, they, need, they might need protection from potentially immigrant males or, or other aggressive females. Um, so that's one counter strategy to that particular, uh, that particular way in which baboons know that females are pregnant. I think we have a really poor understanding in almost all other species, whether or not males know that females are pregnant. For the most part, researchers don't, unless they're collecting hormone samples. And uh, we might be biased to assume that that means that animals don't, um, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, and I guess more broadly speaking, your question about counter strategies, I think that kind of all of the arguments that people make about counter strategies to infanticide uh, equally apply to, to arguments about, about feticide. And so they can be effective to, to an extent and maybe aren't perfect, um, but, but more broadly speaking, when people invoke infanticide to explain an apparent counter strategy, perhaps they should really be invoking both infanticide uh, and feticide 
or alternatively in some species, just be the same. Great, thanks, Matthew. Uh, we have another question from YouTube uh, on, the on the same topic. So uh, do males kill fetuses via maybe via their direction or do females terminate them to avoid wasting further resources on an infant male that would, infant a male would kill anyway? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, there's, I'll, I'll answer it in two different ways. The first answer is we don't really know um, the agency of the female involved, but in the baboon system, um, it's not like all females are terminating their pregnancy following male immigration. It's just a subset and it's a minority at that, a pretty small minority. And so it would seem like if it's a good strategy for some females to terminate their pregnancy, at least a, a few of them, you'd expect that all or nearly all females would pursue that strategy in order to avoid future infanticide. And since infanticide is itself quite rare in this population, I think that that's not the case. I think that this is a case where males are causing enough either physical or psychological stress to induce termination in the female. Um, the, the strategy that you allude to, which is to terminate in order to prevent uh, future wasted resources in, in in, an, in a developing fetus that would later be killed by infanticide is the most likely explanation for the evolution of the Bruce effect, which is a phenomenon by which uh, seemingly without the need for physical aggression by males, females acro across a pretty wide range of mammalian species uh, terminate their pregnancies or block implantation in, um, of pregnancies following their exposure to non-sire. Uh, males. And the, the, the thought process there is that in those situations, right, infanticide is likely to be a much greater risk, right? So in this, in the imbecile population, uh, if a female doesn't terminate, her offspring probably still isn't at a very great risk of infanticide. Whereas in, in, in rodents and in, in gelatas, for example, um, the risk of infanticide, if they fail to terminate, is extremely high. And so in those situations, it is advantageous to females to terminate, but I think not in the case of imbecile. Great, thanks. And I'm going to end, I think, with one more question that I'm curious about, uh, your modeling of the pace of life history. Um, do you, have you thought about or compared, and I forgot uh, what your results were from the previous thing, how the um, model results inform whether you saw links or not to the species and their pace of life histories? Uh, so I haven't done that yet. That's what I, gosh, sure would like to do it as a, as a postdoc. Um, so like the dream is to perform this really broad comparative analysis where I measure those links uh, between maternal survival and offspring fitness across a wide range of mammalian species and ask whether pace of life is predicted by the strength or number of those, of those links. And that's a project that's ongoing. Um, uh, I'm working to contact additional collaborators. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this, this analysis in the next couple of years. I'll let you know. Great, thanks. Uh, so I think we will end there with Matthew's uh, postdoc <laughs> uh, application. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone, all of our speakers from this year and this uh, fall and, for, and everyone out there joining us. Matthew, do you have anything else to say? Oh, no. Well, thanks, everybody. But if you haven't filled out the feedback form, the thanks only goes halfway. So go fill out the feedback form. Thanks so much to everyone who already has. Uh, it's been really fun and, and we'll see you next year, but not in the spring. So. Great. Thanks all. Bye.